Uh, welcome everyone to Making the North a Global Powerhouse, which is our session today. And it's my privilege to have the opportunity to chair it and to be joined by John Boehner, who's the 53rd Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Lakshmi Kaul, who's from the Confederation of Indian Industry, and Catherine Richardson, who is the Deputy Director of the Department of International Trade Northern Powerhouse Team. It's also great to be sponsored today by Squire Patton Boggs, a global law firm with local connections. I'm Jake Berry. I'm the former Northern Powerhouse Minister. In fact, the only Northern Powerhouse Minister ever to attend Cabinet in that role. I'm now a backbench member of Parliament, but head of something called the Northern Research Group in Parliament, which is moving forward the Northern Powerhouse. I think today is a hugely exciting session to give us the opportunity to explore the possibility of improving the North's position in terms of an exporting superpower. But before we get into that, I just want to focus on the 333 billion pound that already is the North's economy, making us on our own one of the largest economies in Europe. And 60 billion of that already goes in exports with 6.3 billion pounds to the United States of America, over 5 billion pounds to Germany, and 2.6 billion pounds to China. We have proven capabilities, particularly in high value manufacturing, education, energy, and life sciences. And I hope today gives us the opportunity to explore how from the creation of the first computer, IVF, atomic theory, carbon fiber, and even carbonated drinks, the North can continue to lead the world as an exporting economy. So we're going to cover three areas today in terms of free trade, and I'm going to come to each of our panelists in turn to discuss their experience of it. The first is just focusing down on that £6 billion plus trading market with the United States of America. John Boehner, who, as I said, was Speaker of the House of Representatives, is going to briefly tell us about the opportunity to move beyond a national trade deal, which may now seem limited, with the election of the opportunity for it may seem limited in terms of time with the election of the new president, um, to how we can move to a subnational trade links with states such as Florida or Texas or any other of those American friends we have on the other side of the pond. But John, you've got the, the most experience in this area. What, what do you think the opportunity is for Northern businesses? Uh, well, Jake, uh, good morning, and uh, good morning to my fellow panelists and to uh, all those who have tuned in today. Uh, as Jake said, my name is John Boehner. I spent 25 years in Washington as a member of Congress and uh, spent five of those years as the uh, Speaker of the United States uh, Congress. Uh, interesting uh, uh, background. I've got 11 brothers and sisters. My dad owned a tavern. Uh, if you want to know more, after this is all over, you can. I've got a book coming out in about three weeks called on the house kind of a little story about myself and uh and my uh, my years in politics which i never in my life expected i would ever do you know we've got a uh, new president uh, senator joe biden longtime friend of mine uh, although he's a democrat i'm a republican uh joe biden and i worked out more deals than you could have ever imagined uh, he's a good guy uh and uh but you know he, he tends to be uh, a bit left uh, but these days in the Democrat Party, he's being drugged, uh, not uh, willingly, uh, a little further left to go. And, and, uh, and as Jake mentioned, uh, I think uh, uh, there's an interest in a, in a UK-US uh, trade agreement. Uh, I think uh, with the new administration and, uh, and, and then frankly, uh, 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 for, the, for the Brits uh, getting their, their trade offices set up and uh and moving it, it's going to take a little while but i would think over the next year or two we'd have a real good shot at, uh, at getting uh, a trade agreement one thing you should keep in mind is uh, we're negotiating this agreement uh, with all of you uh we're going to have to look over our shoulder at a broader a broader us eu uh trade deal which has been talked about and talked about uh, i think there's some serious uh, issues important in in, in uh, to, to get us there, but uh, 
they're going to be it's going to it's going to put a cloud over of uh, the trade deal that we eventually will come to an agreement with all of you on. Uh, so, but, but as Jake mentioned, uh, there are there are a lot of the U.S. is 330 million people, and uh, you got states like Texas, uh, you got states like Ohio, uh, Georgia, uh, Arizona, Colorado uh, that have big economies, and uh, you know Ohio is a big uh, old industrial. Uh, state, it's still uh, it's it's still the largest uh, uh, auto parts uh, state in the country, uh, second largest auto manufacturing facility in the uh, facilities in the country, and so uh, what I'm here to suggest is that uh, each of these states has uh, some type of commerce department uh, looking at, uh, at putting together uh, relationships between. Uh, manufacturers in the or in those states and and suppliers from all over the world and uh, and it would it be someplace I would direct your attention to uh, depending upon what your industry is what it is that you're interested uh, in exporting uh, you'll find that uh, that these states are really willing to work with you and uh, really willing to be helpful because they're trying to be helpful on behalf of the, the companies that are in their states so I don't uh, I don't get blinded by the the big headlines about uh, the latest uh, uh, miscue in the U.S. U.K. Uh, trade deal. Uh, look at these states. Look at where your customers uh, or potential customers might be, and begin to work with uh, those state officials. And uh, I think uh, you you're likely to have far more success, especially in the short term. And John, I mean, you're absolutely right to say that because, of course, business isn't done state to state. It's done business to business. Would you, do these uh, individual states have a significant budget? And how would people find uh, the sort of information if you were in the auto industry or in uh, food production or agriculture? How, how, how would you sort of go about, you know, reaching out and finding those connections as a business to business position? Well, you, you could... Uh... You could you could Google uh, these days. You know you can Google almost anything, uh, and, uh, and you, you shouldn't have any problem finding potential customers uh, in any state. Or or you could go find uh, the commerce department in any of these states, uh, who will also have uh, a pretty uh, serious list of uh, the types of industries in their states, and uh, maybe even a list of businesses uh, in each of those uh, industries in those states. And so uh, it's, I think it'd be easy to uh, track down, easy to find. Uh, I'm now a strategic, uh, senior strategic advisor uh, with Squire Patton Boggs. Uh, we have uh, 23 offices around the U.S. Uh, and uh, obviously we've got 47 offices in 23 countries. Uh, but uh, my point here is that we've got offices all over the U.S. And frankly, we can be helpful uh, in terms of uh, tracking down uh, the types of uh, potential customers that you're looking for. Fantastic. Oh, no, I, I hope if we were to Google um, breaking into new markets, Catherine, one of the the things would come up near the top of the list would be uh, the Department for International Trade. Have you got a real strategy on developing uh, the, the U.S. Uh, market for northern businesses? Yeah, thank you, Jake. Absolutely. Um, I mean, as you know, building on, on what John has already said, the UK and the US already do more together than any two countries in the world. And um, so it's starting from a, a really strong base. And um, here in the Department for International Trade, our job is to make life easier, whether you're a business in the northern powerhouse wanting to get out and export or whether you're looking for investment. Or indeed, might be an investor out in the in the US and looking for for somewhere to put your money. And we, of course, think we're better than, than here in the north. And um, we've got trade specialists based throughout the US. So as well as the kind of the more obvious places like you know, Boston and Chicago and, and New York and, and Washington, we also have people based um, in Houston, in Atlanta. 
Um, and actually, we've got some brand new um, overseas officers, two currently based in Houston. We've got one about to be recruited in Atlanta who actually work for the Northern Powerhouse. So they work for my team and they're there to promote mainly about investment opportunities, uh, but to bring money in, into the North. So as well as that kind of expertise about the, the US and the UK generally, we've got, we're putting some real investment into growing that and um, those kind of Northern Texan and Northern uh, to, to parts of, of US relationships. And Catherine, what would you say the sort of real opportunity is? And I, 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 Texas on its own is, is one of the biggest economies in the world. And um, what would you say the sort of the growth area opportunities are there for our, our viewers today? I mean, I mean what, I what, does Texas, what does Texas need from the North? I, was, I mean, I think the number one has to be life sciences. Uh, and certainly where we uh, are recruiting people into these roles, we're looking for um, experts in, in life sciences is, is the kind of the big one. And as you said from the, um, in your introduction, the North is absolutely world leader there. So something that, you know, there's, there's lots of, of links to be made there. Um, I think tech generally, um, fintech is something that, again, we're, we're kind of looking at and exploring. We've got um, a UK North America week planned in June, um, where the um, Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner there, Anthony Phillipson, will be hosting. That's, that'll be a virtual event, but that'll be looking, um, yeah, as I say, life sciences, fintech, but really, you know, kind of exploring where those opportunities are. Fantastic, because I, I just think that's a real challenge for the business community because, you know, we often talk about these, uh, you know, th these big trade deals done by the government. And of course, we've recently signed deals with uh, Japan. We've roll over, roll over our deal with Canada. But in truth, it is just tends to be that, you know, I, I own a, a factory in Wakefield that um, is doing really exciting things in, in fintech. Uh, or, you know, business or that's doing exciting things in fintech, you know, where, where, how do I find my markets? And I guess that's where the Department for International Trade is there ready and able to, to support. But of course, we have different opportunities as well, uh, because I want to bring Lakshmi in here to tell us a little bit about the work she does with the Confederation of India, Indian industry because of course in the uk we all we have a significant living bridge and diaspora with countries around the world including the us uh, but particularly in the north of england we we do have a, a significant opportunity i think to develop trade with south asia by using that living bridge and it's something you've done a lot of work on Lakshmi. i think you've done quite a lot of research on about how we can how we can use those existing connections to really drive our exporting economy isn't it I'm going to say a namaste um, from the north of India. I'm currently in India. I'm in a place called Shimla that many British people and also Americans are familiar with. Perhaps it's almost like it used to be the summer um, destination for uh, many people to live in. Um, my name is Lakshmi Kaul and I head the Confederation of Indian Industry in the UK. A very interesting conversation about US-EU trade agreement about in you know UK and uh, US it almost felt like we were discussing India. <laughs> so John, it's a similar story. Um, my job is to represent the interests of Indian industry in the UK and to service the corridor, the economic corridor between India and UK. We're almost poised to signing, um, hopefully, the Enhanced Trade Partnership Agreement and then they're on the um, India-UK Trade Agreement, the Free Trade Agreement, uh, hopefully not not too uh, far away from from where we are today the uk prime minister is due to be visiting india so everybody in india is welcoming you know waiting for his visit so that these important partnerships can be struck jake you talked about the you know, relevance of these trade agreements um from the living bridge perspective why are these trade agreements important and why is business connectivity important it's a living bridge of opportunities, of people, of culture, um, of investment that that drives these trade agreements forward. What works and what doesn't work is ascertained often by people who are going to be affected by it first and foremost, and therefore the business opportunities. I'm quite um, pleased to say that India is the second highest FDI contributor to the UK 
after us um so it's quite an interesting discussion here so it's quite fascinating um and what i would like to say is that um indian companies are global companies and any companies that you talk of um, you know whether it is from india or elsewhere you would have an indian footprint um in it indian presence in it indian leadership in the business com community as well globally um in the uk that's not a different story either about 842 indian companies uh, currently exist in the uk uh, contributing about 41.2 billion pounds in turnover um it's massive massive amount of money now who what do these companies mean i mean these companies mean uh, jobs are created locally and it all starts with these people coming visiting people who are already present in the uk who will create these opportunities i mean you've seen many many stories um you know um in the news some good and some not so good through the pandemic of how you know the frontline workers majority of them many of them are of indian origin and you know there is massive contribution not just to the fabric of the society but also to to business enhancement whilst jobs were being laid off and people were being sort of uh given the thing slip if you like um there were indian companies trying to retain the jobs and interestingly the statistics of number of jobs created by indian companies between the last year uh, the and the year before um the year before it was 105000 plus jobs and last year we documented about 110000 jobs now you'd think that's an interesting statistic when investments are slowly going down uh but the jobs have been more or less retained and increased in numbers and we've seen a very strong pipeline of uh big announcements due later on this year perhaps i mean even the next month so these are all driven by people uh first and foremost which is a living bridge and it's a it's a term that has been coined recently i mean people's contribution hasn't been seen as such a bridge and it really is is the bridging of opportunities between the two countries you fall in love with a country and then you want to do and mo do more and more with it it it's as simple as that uh, the business story isn't it well that is uh, absolutely brilliant and of course it goes back i think to what john was saying about people doing business with each other it's not I I often tell people if they ask me for advice that you know the best thing to do is to pick the phone up to your customer rather than to the government uh, because the government can help you but uh, you know people do business with each other John do you see much of this uh, concept in the United States with the significant and varied community and population you have with with people sort of using those connections of communities in the United States to develop trade with other uh, states around the world uh, well, you know, America is uh, the largest melting pot in the world. And uh, so we, we have people from every part of the world, every country in the world, uh, who make up. And uh, when you were talking about, uh, or when uh, Lakshmi was talking about the, the Living Bridge, I was thinking to myself, uh, I've worked with the uh, uh, Indian uh, Business Association uh, in Washington, D.C. for the last uh, 30 years. And uh, and there's a very strong uh, Indian community in the U.S. and, frankly, uh, thousands of successful businesses owned by uh, Indian nationals in the U.S. Uh, obviously, uh, with our proximity to Mexico, uh, there are a lot of Mexican-Americans, uh, many of them uh, who still have uh, significant relationships across the border. And uh, and the, clearly the trade uh, between Mexico and the U.S. is significant. Uh, and so uh, there, th these uh, these human connections, human bridges, as they, they, you refer to them, uh, are are real, and they're frankly very important. Uh, but uh, set that aside for a moment. Uh, at the end of the day, U.S. businesses uh, want want suppliers uh, that they can count on that are competitive. And, uh, and given uh, uh, how easy uh, air transport uh, is these days, uh, given uh, the type of product or service, uh, you know, it, it's easily deliverable. And, uh, and, and so uh, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, cap on the amount of uh, opportunities uh, that we have in the United States. You know, I'm a, I'm a product of the American dream. You know, and uh, there's no cap in America. 
And so uh, there's no cap on your ability to do business in America. Uh, you just got to go find the, the potential customers and make your case. I used to be in the packaging and plastics industries before I stumbled into the political arena and spent uh, nearly 20 years running my own business. And, uh, you know, I used to be concerned that I couldn't deliver this or I wasn't good enough to do X, Y, or Z. Well, guess what I found out? Uh, if you don't try, you'll never know. And uh, I ended up running a very successful business and uh, uh, only because I didn't let the barriers get in my way. And Jake, I should have mentioned, in 2015, I visited the Northern Powerhouse at the request and invitation of George Osborne. Uh, we were going, we were in England on, on our way to the Middle East uh, for several weeks of, with a group of members uh, trying to get our arms around uh, what was happening. And uh, it happened to be the first day of campaigning uh, during that year's elections. And uh, so I flew to Manchester with uh, six or seven of my uh, uh, colleagues from Congress. And uh, George hosted us uh, for a luncheon. And then we did a, a, uh, we did a news conference uh, at a high tech company uh, in Manchester. And George, before the, uh, uh, the news conference, must have told me 20 times, remember, Northern Powerhouse, <laughs> Northern Powerhouse, Northern Powerhouse. Trust me, I will never forget the Northern Powerhouse. Well, John, let's uh, hope that the government uh, keeps up that drumbeat of the Northern Powerhouse, because I often comment to colleagues here in Parliament that, um, you know, and I think it's a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a phrase and a term uh, that the government has lost control of. Uh, because the government is in Whitehall and Westminster and we are in the north and we've sort of taken ownership of it and that's why we have brilliant conferences like Invest North pushing the concept of it but it is a globally recognized brand and uh, I, I tell my own story that when I was in Shanghai at the uh, global manufacturing uh, expo uh, we had a long discussion with um, UK government representatives there about whether there was a Chinese character for to represent the northern powerhouse and of course there is because president xi uh in his one belt one road speech specifically referenced the north of england as one of the uh, best places around the world to invest and to grow your business and guess what i completely agree with him it's probably the only thing i agree with president xi about um but you know it is a, a huge opportunity i think catherine it, it's sort of with that in mind um what sort of work are, are you doing in the Department of International Trade? It, twofold, one, to develop this idea of these brilliant, uh, this idea of this brilliant living bridge and the relations we have through family connections and existing businesses here in the North of England, how we can sort of almost piggyback onto those existing relations to, to, to build exporting across the North of England. And also really interested to hear whether you have any analysis of that power of brand Britain and brand Northern Powerhouse around the globe, because I know it's something you're really pushing for businesses in the North. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Jack. I think, um, you know, you mentioned there about people using their personal connections. I think, you know, whenever you're from the, the government, and I should say, Jay, we are based in the North, our Northern Powerhouse team, you'll be pleased to know, except for those colleagues, of course, who are based around the world. We do have a, a couple in India as well. Um, but apart from that, we, we are based in the North. Um, but of course, we, we are here to support people who are thinking about exporting, who are already exporting a little and want to, want to get out. Um, and for those people seeking investment or, or looking to provide investment, I think um, the the thing for us in government to think about is is kind of where best to to place that support. Um, you know, there's the the joke: the last thing you want to hear as a business person is someone from government coming in and saying we're here to help you. Um, so really, it's about seeking out what what support is needed where people already have those personal relationships they already have really strong businesses and um, perhaps what they need is um peer-to-peer -peer relationships so they might be looking for support from other other businesses uh, so we can we can help there we've got a network of 135 export champions so these are, are really successful businesses in the north people who are 
um, helping other businesses, showing what they did and, and kind of sharing their, their contacts. Um, we've actually just set up a, uh, a network. We're setting up a network of um, investment champions as well. So we've got 10 investment champions, including a fantastic Indian company uh, who, again, are doing that kind of peer-to-peer -to -peer support. We've got a huge amount in terms of uh, things like the Export Academy. So that is uh, a kind of series of um, way teaching people about exports. And you're doing that in a, in a place where you're surrounded by other good businesses, people who are looking to, to start exporting. And um, so really kind of building up that, uh, that network. We've got um, lots of international trade advisors. We've got even more for the North now as part of our leveling up funding. Uh, and these are people who, um, through lots of different types of events or one-to-one um, -one help can kind of support and, and provide advice. Um, we do have some funds to help um, and, and kind of lots of, uh, of joining things together. So um, there's actually lots of different types of things that the Department for International Trade can do. It, it really depends. Are you, are you a, a business that's looking to get started in exporting? Are you, are you seeking investment? Where are you looking for? We've got people, we've got 1,500 people based right around the world. So really, well, whatever you're thinking of, we've got people to help. So I would just encourage people to kind of, you know, as you say, if you, if you Google trade support, then I'm going to I'm gonna say we will be the top person. <laughs> we should be right there at the top. Um, you know, you can go on the gov.uk website um, and, and get in touch with us and we can work out what, what kind of support is best. And um, what is the role of the, I mean, we've got a great question just come up from Sue Barnard, uh, but could you just expand a bit, Catherine, on the role of investment champions and how they can help your your business? Because uh, there's a bit of desire to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. So the, these are um, people who have invested in the north and have kind of already done it successfully um, and what they're kind of ready and willing to do is to talk to um, other um, people who are looking to invest um, but also for, for those people seeking investment so it's more of a kind of you know we, we've already done it this is this is how we did it um, because we only have 10 at the minute and um, of course we're uh, we're trying to make sure that we are uh, kind of deploying them and, and using them in, in the best way we are looking to, to expand um, but, you know, it, it'd probably be that we are looking to um, set up kind of group discussions uh, and that kind of thing. So if, you know, um, for anyone who is interested, I don't know if the, the organisers can share my details, um, but as well as the, the government website, I'd be really happy for people to, to get in touch with me um, and I'll kind of let you know what uh, what's going on, you know, let you let us know which bits you're interested in and we'll tell you what events are going on in your area of course one of the um advantages at the minute of everything being virtual is that uh, kind of wherever things are going on um you know more people are able to join in that's fantastic I, it, it is really exciting to talk about how we can make the north the global landing pad for international investment uh, i recently come off a report called the the big bang with the sense of the policy studies, which is really looking about how we can encourage investment to come to the north. And it reminded me, uh, John, that um, Woody Johnson, uh, the former uh, ambassador to the United Kingdom, used to talk about wanting to hear the whoosh of funds arriving from around the globe to invest in the UK. Um, what do you think the opportunity is, John, for US businesses, particularly, you know, how can we sort of work with them to highlight investment opportunities which abound across the north of England and not just in traditional things like businesses, but of course, opportunities to invest in UK infrastructure? What, what do you think the opportunity is there? Well, I think that uh, with the amount of capital that's uh, frankly sitting on the sidelines in the US at the moment, uh, investors are looking for uh, a place to invest uh, and uh, where they can get a stable long-term return. And, uh, and as a result, they're looking all over the world. And I think uh, uh, making the Northern powerhouse made this case uh, is very important because in the U.S., people don't look at, uh, they don't know anything about the Northern powerhouse. A few might, uh, but, you know, they look at, the Brits is the Brits. Uh, and at some point, uh, 
uh, if you want to draw attention to the Northern powerhouse, you have to tell people about it. And, uh, and whether it's uh, infrastructure, whether it's uh, uh, new business, expanding, help someone expanding their business, uh, there's serious capital in the U.S. Uh, looking for that kind of opportunity. Make your case. Yeah, I mean, John, you uh, rather agree with uh, me in my report, but which was saying that we actually need an office of northern investment. And I know it's something the government has is looking at in sport, exploring and particularly in the area of green energy. I think there's a huge opportunity because it's a big uh, we hear uh, or read mainly in the financial papers here in this country about this phenomena of the SPAC, the Special Purpose Acquisition Company, uh, very big on the US stock exchange at the moment. But only last week, uh, Pacific Green Energy made an announcement to the New York Stock Exchange, I think it was, about setting out on a mission to acquire battery storage and other green energy assets in the UK. And that is a real opportunity because the Northern Powerhouse is absolutely at the forefront of what we call the green industrial revolution here in the United Kingdom. And I think that's a real opportunity to develop trade, not just with the United States, but around the globe. How, how long can this SPAC bubble last, do you think? You know, there's a bit of concern about it in the States, John. Do you reflect that? Well, there is some concern that uh, uh, this is uh, stretching what the, the law and the regulations are really intended. And so there's been some concern about uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, shutting down SPACs. Uh, so uh, there's been some effort underway to move them pretty quickly uh, before <coughs> uh, Biden's uh, nominees uh, get some footing and begin to look closely at whether they're going to continue to allow SPACs or not. But I, I, there's, there is some concern about their future. We don't want them shut down until we've got all the money into the North of England. Right. <laughs> we want them to keep getting a bit uh, longer. Um, Lakshmi, you have been um, working really closely. I know you're doing amazing work uh, sort of promoting the North of England, uh, particularly in India. I think one of the challenges we really have is people don't realise how fantastic the brand of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain, and the Northern powerhouses around the globe, because we, we live here. But do you, is it still a, a global brand, Britain, um, that appeals to uh, different uh, different countries around the globe? Do you see that in your work promoting the North in India? Yes and no. I mean, when people think of England, like you know, John said, um, it's the Brits. You know, it's it's Britain, mm -hmm. and mostly it is London. You know, it has been traditionally, UK is equal to London. It it um, unfortunately, but um, in the last three and a half years, what we've seen is since the setting up of the Manchester India Partnership, of which you know CIA has been a founding partner, and Jake, you were there when we launched the mm -hmm. partnership as well. Um, so. Um, such regional India partnerships have helped give almost like a facelift or or promote the region and its opportunities a lot more than what typically you know you'd have. And DIT is you know doing a tremendous job of promoting opportunities, um, handholding, supporting. I mean, I think Catherine, I've worked with many, many, many of your colleagues uh, by now. I mean, sectorally, regionally. Um, I mean, cross cross section of colleagues who worked, um, who I've worked with, and who have worked in turn with our colleagues. Now, India is also very complicated uh, for people. I mean, every time you talk to people, they're like, um, "Well, India is too big, India is too populated, India is too complex to understand." But um, those who are within the network or who actually uh, come in contact with us realize that it's not that complicated. I mean, uh, I'm glad that you talked about the green energy and, you know, you talked about um, not too far away from the Northern Powerhouse is the uh, is going to be the COP26 uh, conference later on this year. Um, and a lot of activity around green recovery, around generally around economic recovery, which is the focus of all economies around the world, particularly for India, lives and livelihoods is, is the key sort of, you know, mantra protecting lives and then also ensuring safeguarding livelihoods and how do you do that by only promoting businesses and making sure that sort of connect happens and it's not going to happen without investments now 
inward and outward investments because that's what helps grow businesses and their um, expanse. So um, Britain is important to India. I mean, if you talk to an average Indi uh, Indian company, uh, where in the world, you know, which are the key economies that you'd like to uh, key geographies that you'd like to be present in, UK becomes very, very prominent and it's still a preferred location for Indian businesses to invest in. And that's why you see such a high investment number. I mean, that that's statistic. Um, but then the opportunities are not necessarily always known. And that's probably our job to uh, constantly hammer in what are the opportunities sectorally with an increased sort of focus on sectors and on uh, partnership with different regions. I mean, for the Midlands, it has been traditionally Maharashtra and Midlands. But what prevents Maharashtra from, you know, partnering with uh, companies and businesses in powerhouse? Nothing. Um, creative industry, material sciences, I mean, life sciences, the, you name it and you've got it all. Students, there's such a high number of students from India in the Northern Powerhouse region across universities. Um, so um, UK is popular in India. I mean, UK is definitely not for the wrong reasons, for the right reasons. <laughs> There's obviously history. But um, currently, a lot of students would prefer to come into uh, to the UK. So would you know businesses and, and individuals. In fact, there's been a, lo a lot of uh, high net worth individuals investing in the UK, um, buying properties and, you know, commercial real estate as well as, you know, residential uh, real estate. So, yes, there have been there has been a lot of interest. And you'll see during the COP conference, you'll see a lot of other, you know, uh, movement as well within the North because they're already coming towards the North. So North Powerhouse has to be right up there <laughs> in leveraging these opportunities. Finally, I mean, I'd actually like to give you an example of how the energy partnership between India and UK has been so, uh, so hugely successful. One of the fastest growing Indian companies uh, has been the EESL, which is a joint venture uh, with Edina uh, Group. And that's one of the fastest growing Indian companies in the UK. So, I mean, joint ventures, uh, partnerships um, with UK companies is, Indian companies know that is the way forward and that's how they will grow. So it's actually mutually looking at opportunities and making sure both grow together. And that's what will shape the growth story of both countries and, you know, around the world as well. Thank you. Well, Catherine, I really great that um, people are so excited about the forthcoming COP26. I think we may. I mean, Scotland's definitely in the north, if it, even if not in the northern powerhouse. We've got um, this real global focus on the United Kingdom. And of course, we are already here in the north of England, particularly in the northeast, global leaders in uh, the green industrial revolution and, and green tech. And in fact, most of the subsea cabling uh, used in the world comes from uh, Newcastle and the northeast. Catherine, for people in that area, and particularly thinking forward to COP26, um, you know, is there going to be a real focus that we're going to see from the government to help some of these new industries break through, not just here in the UK, but also uh, around the world? Absolutely. And you're right, COP26 is a, is a wonderful opportunity. Um, it's great for the UK, for us in the Northern Powerhouse. Uh, you know, we'll make sure that we are we are there. Um, our, our brilliant stakeholders who are great at shouting about the, the North, they will be there as well. Um, I think you're right, there's... Um, he, here in the north, we've got some kind of long-standing um, green technologies that that we have been kind of leading on. Um, but there's quite a lot uh, of new things coming through. So the things like sustainable construction and precision agriculture and green finance and, and these kind of areas that are, are kind of you know really growing up, where the, the north in particular is, is quite strong on it. So I think it will be about us making sure not just through COP26, but that we're we sort of um, giving the opportunity for these smaller, um, you know, the, these smaller growth areas to, to kind of come through. I always think something like COP26 is a, is a brilliant uh, focus. We should be working towards it. We should not just look at the, you know, the main events, but there will be loads going on around and outside it. So I would, you know, really encourage whatever size 
business or organization you are don't think that it's kind of too big for you because there will be loads of fringe events and, and things going on so i would have a look and, and see what you can get involved in fantastic and and john bit of a a, a change in attitude that we're still seeing from the new uh, president of the united states in relation to the green energy and decarbonization of the economy over there do you think that will be reflected in uh, the cop 26 discussions with uh, the usa well, I'm sure it will be. Uh, I think it'll be difficult for the the administration and the Congress uh, to really pass much in the way of legislation. Uh, but I do look for the the new administration uh, to use virtually every agency of the federal government uh, to begin uh, taking steps uh, toward renewable energy, green energy, and uh, and so uh, as uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, come to this conference i can tell you it'll be a uh, a big topic of uh, conversation on on our behalf fantastic well i mean i just want to briefly point out of course john has has said if you, if you want to uh contact squire pattern box we do have offices across the globe actually not just in the united states but we also have some doing business in guides that are available for the squire pattern box stand at today's event and also are available afterwards for people who want to uh, get them. I, I think um, on, the, on the issue of doing business in, Catherine, almost getting towards the, the, the final words on this, but look, people who I, I know because uh, I'm involved with and run a, a, my family business myself, but people who are doing business, well, they, they are pretty busy, although um, you know, they, they concentrate on running their business. They often don't think about uh developing new markets and export and they want to really use a friendly interaction with government support perhaps you could say how the department for international trade in quite a light touch way i think is able to support businesses and why people should take their eye off running their business even for a really short period of time to sort of tool up and skill up uh, for export and what what you can do to help Thank you, Jay. I mean, as you say, if people are even thinking about exporting, we often say that that's part of the, the trickiest bit. For me, talking to our export champions, I'll often say that the hardest bit was the, that kind of slightly change of I'm going to focus on what I'm doing here and, and look outside. Of course, for our export champions, they all say it was the best thing that they ever did. Uh, it, it's interesting hearing them, actually, because they're, they're so enthusiastic about exporting and, and what it's done for their business and for themselves personally. You know, they have the... Um, it's great to hear the kind of the positives of it and, and how well it, it's done for them. I mentioned the Export Academy um, quite early on. I mean, that is a, a structured program of webinars and events. It's free. It's something that we've set up with experts, trade experts, the export champions are involved um, to really take businesses through step by step what it is that you need to be thinking about. I've attended some of it and it's, it's really um, kind of, accessible uh, and, and a kind of really good way in. So I would encourage people, if you're thinking about it, have a look at the Export Academy, just Google it and, and get in touch with us that way. We do have our digital platforms, which is normally the best way for people to kind of first come into us. Um, but as I say, once we uh, ha can have a conversation about what, what kind of support is, is required, we do have those international trade advisors uh, a network of them across the north and in fact across the UK who can um, really help provide kind of precision advice uh, for, for what it is that you're there for and also to link you up with these export champions. We'll have them in your uh, area of work, in your local area um, and that, that peer support people generally have found really useful. So I would encourage people to, to get in touch with us, uh, have a look into it and we can really help with that first step uh we the session is uh, just about to end i think the comment of the day in the uh, comment box thank you for everyone who's watched as everyone who's taken part thank you for everyone who told me that we were live in the comment box when i was sort of waiting for an alarm bell to go off to notify us that we were about to start um i suppose the comment of the day goes to john uh because he's been picked up as always as a as a star in the chat box which says the the key uh to being a successful exporter 
is just to make it happen. And there's a brilliant panel. Thank you for all of our panelists for taking part today. Thank you for Square Pattern Box for sponsoring us. Please do go and look for those doing business in guides. Get in touch with the Cashman Department for International Trade. And let's ensure that we deliver the North as a global exporting powerhouse. Thank you.